Hello, everyone, and welcome to OHSCA Interviews. I'm Vincenzo Calla, and I'm your host for today's episode. Today, I'm happy to have with me the MP for Brantford Brand, Larry Brock. Larry was first elected on September 20th, 2021, and currently serves as the Deputy Shadow Minister for Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Larry has a bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo and a law degree from the University of Calgary. Before being elected, he was the Assistant Crown Attorney for Brandt. Thank you, Larry, for your time, and thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to it, Vincenzo. So we're going to start off our interview the way we always start off our interviews with our question and answer segment. And all of these questions are asked by our high school team. So the first question, quite simple, it's what was your motivation to run for office? Well, I can tell you, Vincenzo, it, was, uh, it wasn't a, a rash uh, decision by any means. I have been involved in the uh, federal conservative scene in my riding for probably close to 15 years, very active in the provincial uh, conservative riding, involved in municipal politics. I studied politics in university. I've always had a love as to how uh, there's an intersection between uh, government and our daily lives. Uh, as a lawyer, as you alluded to, me being a Crown attorney, I'm very passionate about our rights and freedoms as enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So I, um, I felt that as a Crown attorney, I had reached sort of a glass ceiling in terms of advancement uh, I was looking to be inspired to do more in my community. I've always prided myself on being a great public servant and assisting victims of crime, validating their concerns, trying to uh, rehabilitate them through the process, giving them the confidence to move forward uh, as a victim. So I've taken great pride in my successes uh, over the years, but I felt I didn't like what I was seeing in the community in Brantford Brant. I didn't like the rise of crime in my community. I've been born and raised in Brantford Brant and the likes of which I have in the last, really the last 10 years, I did not like to see the trend that I saw. So we had the increase in serious crime, an increase in guns, an increase in homicides, an increase in other serious bodily harm offenses. We had, uh, and as many communities across this country are suffering the uh, significant physical, emotional, and psychological traumas of the pandemic. We have a significant opiate crisis uh, in the uh, in the Branford Brant uh, riding. We have a homeless issue. We also have a real disconnect, in my opinion, with respect to Canada's relationship with our Indigenous neighbours. And I don't know, Vincenzo, if you are aware of it, but uh, my riding also encompasses the largest Indigenous reservation in Canada, known as the Six Nations of the Grand River. So in my role as a former Crown Attorney, I've had numerous opportunities to make connections, very positive connections, uh, into that community advocating for positive changes, addressing some of the uh, inequities that exist on that uh, particular reserve. And I just wanted to ensure that the relationship they had with the government was gonna be taken seriously, particularly the lack of attention by the current liberal government with respect to the truth and reconciliation report and the calls to action. So I've given you a lot to chew on there as to the motivation I wanted to basically affect change on a national scale and to affect change to the good citizens of Brantford Brad, who gave me this amazing privilege to be their representative in Ottawa. Well, that's a lot of uh, great motivation for sure. I mean, uh, as a, an assistant crown, well, as a crown attorney, as a lawyer, um, obviously you dealt with people and obviously becoming an MP is also a job where you deal with people. So obviously you have sort of that aspect of communicating and that's always something good to, to know as an MP, cause that is your job. And, uh, really a lot of, um, a lot, you mentioned a lot, especially writing specific stuff to you that are a lot of the hot issues right now. And I don't like to say hot issues because these are issues that every, like everyday people are facing every single day. And just because they're, they're the yes. hot topic right now, doesn't mean that 
they will forever be the hot topic, but they will forever be an issue. And a lot of those indigenous issues that you were mentioning as well, uh, the going on to to branch out and con- continue truth and reconciliation and uh, a lot of different issues. I don't know if you're writing, if any of the, the, um, the uh, reserves on your writing are affected by the clean water right now, if they still don't have clean water, we, but I know there are plenty that are do. still affected. So mm-hmm. we do. So if I could just briefly touch upon that, um, as you know, the truth and reconciliation report uh, spoke about certain infrastructures. And I, I view what the supply of water being an essential infrastructure, because in our view, it is not a privilege to have clean water potable water. I've heard too many horror stories or literally over the last 30 years of numerous uh, residents on the Six Nations of the Grand River who do not have appropriate plumbing, who do not or cannot rely upon their, their, their well system because it's contaminated. I know that uh, in early two th- 2010 to 2012, I believe, uh, the government led by Stephen Harper Uh, put in a state-of-the-art water treatment facility on the Six Nations of the Grand River. The only problem is it currently services less than 20% of the entire population of homeowners and businesses. So I think it was estimated that when it was built, it would take approximately another $500 million. And when you take a look at the budget, the trillions of dollars that are being spent on this pandemic in terms of relief, $500 million back then was all that was required to ensure that the necessary water mains were built for every single resident and every single business on the Six Nations. So that has to be addressed. It's still not being addressed. And secondly, there is an Indigenous language school on the Six Nations that does not have its own home. It's been in existence for several decades. They are currently renting space above a lacrosse arena. It's cramped. It's cold. They have no proper plumbing facilities, no potable water. Again, money needs to be made available immediately. They have sought out a location. They've hired an architect. They are shovel ready as far as I'm concerned. They are simply waiting for the federal government to come up with the necessary funding to fund this much needed project. And that goes directly to one of the recommendations, one of the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Report is the preservation of the Indigenous language. Well, those are like, that's, I'd like to say it's shocking that that money hasn't been given. But looking at trends in Canada, it really isn't all that shocking. And it really is something that needs to be fixed. And now I'm sure that there's uh, going forward, hopefully now that you are the MP, um, you can help call those issues in Parliament, bring those forward. And also, I think it's, uh, it's really is something that it takes everybody to work together to get that done. And again, like I mentioned, that's not just an issue right now. You've said over decades, it's been an issue and it will yes. continue to be an issue for decades to come if the if current governments, current politicians don't do anything about it. Now, I'd like to continue talking about this, but I wanna go on to the next question. Certainly. So you gave your idea, your reasons for why you ran for office and why you became an MP. So let's go to election night. So how, Jairit wants to know, how did it feel on election night? You had campaigned for, it was a short period, 35 days or so, about just over a month. And it was election night and you brought all these ideas to your constituents and they voted for you and you won. How did it feel that night on election night when you won and became MP? I'm going to frame my response by stating that I can probably count on one hand the pivotal moments in my life. One becoming a licensed lawyer. It had always been my dream since I was five years old, believe it or not, to be a lawyer. I realized that dream. Getting married, second dream. Very happily married for 20 years. Having children. We have, we're blessed to have, my wife and I, blessed to have two twin daughters, 12 years of age, born on April the 1st, I might add. Um, And then fourth, and most currently, was being elected. So I hearken back to the feeling 
after it was, and it was a very surreal moment, Vincenzo, as I was watching uh, various uh, television sets and watching the results come in from all the major networks, occasionally seeing my name. And uh, initially for the first half an hour, I was trailing. I think I was in third place. Within an hour or so, I had uh, I had made up that gap. We were neck and neck, myself and the Liberal candidate. Ultimately, I surpassed the Liberal candidate and it continued to grow with each passing literally 15 to 20 minutes. And it became very surreal and very real for me, the enormity of what I've been involved in when I finally saw my face on a national television with my name and the words uh, elected or with a little check mark, candidate elected, or I forget how it was phrased, but signifying that there was a sufficient gap that regardless of still polls yet to be reported, I was declared the winner. So that was pretty surreal. Then walking from that location to the stage where I had my family and friends and supporters, walking up that stage, harkened back and brought me back to that same sort of process, walking up the steps of Massey Hall as I was formally recognized as a licensed lawyer by the province of Ontario. It literally brought me back to where I was at the age of 27, 30 years removed. So pure ecstatic, pure joy. It validated the decision that I made, and I made this decision to run for federal politics, Vincenzo, on January the 1st of 2021, when the former member for the riding, a conservative member, decided to retire. So I put together a top-notch nomination uh, team. Ultimately, I won the nomination. I did have a couple of competitors, and literally before the writ was dropped, I was out canvassing. I had always been the canvassing chair in previous elections. I knew that's what took to win elections is communicating with your base, identifying your base. So I was knocking on doors three times a day leading up to the election. Once the writ dropped, I just went into overdrive, knocked on over 25,000 homes. So incredible feeling. And as I say, I simply validated all the hard work and the amazing team that brought me across that finish line. Well, I'm sure I can hear Jairit telling me right now that that was an amazing response because we uh, that's a really good um, description, I'm sure, of what many members, what all 338 members that were elected that night felt when they were called up to the stage and were watching themselves on TV, especially the, I don't know how many newly elected MPs in the whole house there were, but there were quite a few I remember reading this year. Not uh, as much as you think. I think no? there was probably maybe just under 40 uh, nationwide. Okay. Yeah. But that's still yeah. a good amount considering like, well, considering the how fast the election happened. I mean, True. I'm sure yes. all 40 of you uh, that were elected um, all felt either similarly or just felt this new sense of of how do you say it um I don't want to say pressure but responsibility that comes on to you and I'm sure that's something that really felt amazing and I want to continue on that and you mentioned how being a lawyer was always something you always wanted to do uh growing up and like you said since you were five and um you were assistant a crown attorney uh, assistant crown attorney for Brandt so I wanted to ask you, from your time as the assistant crown attorney for Brand, did you encounter any law, uh, flaws with the legal system or anything with the legal system that maybe needed to be changed that you want to fix now that you are an MP? Oh, absolutely. As, as a public servant for the province of Ontario, we received and constantly uh, were updated in terms of various policies various positions that we had to take as, uh, as a representative of uh, Her Majesty in terms of the prosecution. So although you had some personal feelings, maybe some personal reservations with respect to some of the problems in the criminal code, how it wasn't really addressing some of the uh, causes, the root causes of uh, people engaging in criminal activity um, or not necessarily seeing the impact of sentences 
to ensure that the offender is ultimately rehabilitated. So all along, I had these ideas floating around in my mind that instead of simply being a lawyer who has to follow the law, has to interpret the law, and we have laws, as you know, that come from the local level to the provincial level to the national level. So yes, uh, sometimes we uh, present an argument in front of an appellate court that can change the law, but not every lawyer has that opportunity to be an appellate lawyer. I certainly didn't do any appellate law. I was a trial crown lawyer, so I was you know, running trials and running guilty plea courts and dealing with Indigenous offenders courts, bail courts, that type of thing. So I never really had the opportunity to change the law. And I thought, you know what? A politician certainly has that ability. A politician has the ability as the government, okay, to bring forth new bills, which ultimately become new laws, which ultimately can impact amendments to the criminal code, can make society safer. And with my criminal background, that's my overall overriding objective is to ensure that we get back to a semblance of some in my view, the pendulum can, can, can shift from a offender-centric analysis to a victim-centric analysis. And over the last several years, reflecting on my time as a Crown attorney, taking a look at some of the policies that have been introduced by the Liberal government, my perspective now as a legislature is that there was too much focus on the offender and not enough to ensure the protection, the safety of victims moving forward. So again, I was looking at that as a motivation to change. There are some difficulties that I have with our bail system. There is this notion of a catch and release mentality. There have been a number of appellate decisions, which I say provincial uh, appellate decisions from our Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada, that has put more of an emphasis on releasing an offender at every opportunity, that that should be the default position. And in law, that is correct. But when you have repeat offenders that continue to commit the same crime over and over and over again, it impacts the confidence that the public has in the criminal justice system to ensure their safety. It frustrates law enforcement to no end knowing that they're doing their job, they're detecting crime or responding to crime, they're holding offenders responsible, they're arresting, only to see the criminal justice system, system releasing them on very minimal conditions. So I wanted to, and I still have this thought in my mind that there are a number of ways I can improve the bail system through a member's private bill. Unfortunately, as luck would have it, Vincenzo, that it's a lottery as to who has the opportunity of presenting private member bills. Of all the parliamentarians in the House of Commons today, I am dead last. So I know full well, I will not have an opportunity unless someone says, Larry, would you like to move up the rotation to bring my own private member's bill? But that's not gonna stop me as a parliamentarian to be very vocal and active to ensuring that the pendulum is shifting more from the offender, more to the victim to ensure community safety. That's my overriding objective. Amazing, and I mean, like you said, there's obviously many ways to impact the law as a parliamentarian. And although you may not be able to um, to put forward a private member's bill at this time, hopefully you can sometime in the future. But another way that uh, you're able to, I'd love to keep talking about this, but I'm going to go into the next question. Another way you're able to, to impact it, even though you don't have a private member's bill right now, is through your role of the shadow minister, uh, deputy shadow minister for justice and attorney general. So Evan from Ottawa wants to know, what is your role in supporting the shadow minister for justice and attorney general of Canada as the deputy 
So uh, I'm a member of, of cabinet uh, as, a, as a deputy uh, shadow minister. So uh, I will assist my shadow minister in terms of um, uh, reviewing proposed legislation from the government. We receive uh, various uh, proposed bills in advance of it being introduced in the House of Commons. We also, as you know, we receive bills from the Senate. So I was warned at the outset when I accepted this role from my shadow minister, Rob Moore, who's held that position in the last uh, parliament as well, and used to be the parliamentary secretary to the attorney general and the minister of justice under Stephen Harper's government, that it is a very, very busy portfolio. And it was particularly busy in the 43rd parliament that there were a number of bills that they were required to evaluate, to discuss, to make recommendations to the government by way of amendments, to study in committee. So uh, true to his word, literally we started Parliament Vincenzo on the 22nd of November. Within a week or so, committee had not even met yet. In fact, we only met for the first time the last sitting day in December, that being December the 16th. But already my, my shadow minister and I had formed a caucus advisory committee on justice related issues. And we had to take a look at key pieces of legislation, at least I think close to a half a dozen pieces of legislation that were introduced not only by the Senate, but also by the Liberal government. So it was very, very busy. It will continue to be busy in the upcoming uh, winter and spring session. So that's what I do. I assist, I research, I make recommendations that uh, make recommendations obviously to, to my minister that we will take a certain position on a proposed bill, either to approve, seek amendments or to seek the, um, the cancellation of that particular bill or to defeat that bill, I should say. Well, that's a really good, uh, a, a great clear uh, understanding and explanation of what your role as the deputy shadow minister is. And um, really, I know that right now kind of thing, things are kind of in, um, in change right now, now that uh, there's the new interim leader and as we're going into leadership, but we won't touch on that, but I know that uh, things, and then also the the winter session started up uh recently so i know things are very busy for you over on on that side of the bench and i'm sure that uh on that side of the house on our benches and i know that it will be continued to be very busy so more busy but uh well busier but nothing that a, a parliamentarian can't handle for the winter stay inside and avoid the cold <laughs> makes so, for some very long days vincenzo <laughs> very long days for sure it seems like it so um, I'm going to go on to, we're going to go on to our last segment, which is advice for the next generation that we ask this to every single uh, person that comes on our show. And we talk about youth involvement in politics and more. We like to go over this quickly. And we ask, what do you think young high school conservatives can do in order to get more politically active? And one piece of advice you would give them. I think that's a fantastic question, Vincenzo, because I don't, particularly in my writing, it's always been uh, until until I came along, I'd like to think, it's always been a challenge to engage youth in the political process. It's always been a challenge to engage them, particularly at election time. So I have, in my previous career, I have been a firm believer in giving back to uh, students as much as I can. I've made presentations to elementary schools, presentations to high schools, presentations to colleges and universities about what life is like generally as a lawyer. I've assisted high school students in the mock trial program that's been offered by the Canadian Bar Association for a number of years where you take a fictitious uh, case study and you actually pretend that you're a crown or a defense lawyer. You call witnesses and I help them through that process. So I, I'm a firm believer that we have a responsibility as adults to reach out to our youth. They are our future leaders. They are our future citizens of this great country. We need to mold, we need to guide them, we need to give them opportunities. So myself, uh, as a local politician for this particular riding, in the next several weeks, I'm making an announcement that we're creating a youth advisory committee for Brantford Brant, open to any high school student, 
college student, university student, age range anywhere from 14 to 22 to 24. We haven't worked out the fine details, but I want students to get engaged. What is of concern to you in the community? How can I help you as the elected leader federally? How can our elected leader provincially help you? How would you like to assist uh, in any particular campaign. I'm not looking to poach. I'm not looking to recruit. I'm, I'm going to open up this committee to any student of any political denomination or any sort of ideology. We want to hear from the youth to make the whole process exciting. We want to demystify the fear of politics. We want to make it accessible to students. We want them to feel empowered that they are the voice that we as politicians need to hear. So I think in my view, that is a step in the right direction. And I'm so looking forward to launching this and engaging with the youth in my community. Well, that's a great way to, uh, to engage youth. And I know that uh, lots of MPs have advisory committees. Many don't. Uh, youth advisory committees, many don't. But there are a lot that do. And uh, it's just a great way to get involved as well. I mean, and those are great because even though you may be a conservative member of parliament or others may have a new Democrat or a, or a liberal as their representative, youth advisory committees are open to anybody. You don't have to necessarily be the same party. You can just sort of go on and share your beliefs and share, well, not share your beliefs, but share your, uh, your beliefs on a certain issue and what's important to you. And it really is a great way to get involved. So that's a great way to end the interview. Thank you, Larry, for your time today. And we really appreciate you being with us. We wish you well in the future, especially now that I know you're still at the, the very beginning of your parliamentary career because of the way Christmas fell in the, house, the sitting of the house. So you're still quite new to this, but we wish you well in the future. And we have no doubt that you'll continue to become a great member of parliament. So that is it. We hope you enjoyed today's interview. Look, You can look for more interviews coming soon. Make sure to follow our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok accounts at Ontario HS Cons for info about our next interview for some more great content. Make sure to look at our website, OntarioHSConservatives.org to learn more about us, see our projects, and for more great content. For YouTube viewers, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, click the notification bell so you never miss a video. And for our podcast listeners, make sure to follow us and stay updated with new episodes. We hope to see you all soon.